Thank you all for joining us on this webinar. Uh, my name is Leah Laney and I'm the Sales and Service Manager for Exaptive Solutions. And Matt Hadney is gonna be presenting this webinar for you. Uh, there will be a webinar chat window on the side that if you have any questions as we get started, feel free to ask anything. I'll be answering and monitoring that uh, throughout the webinar. If you have any questions after the webinar, uh, you can email us at sales at exapta.com um, or call us at 785-820-8000. And Matt, if you wanna go ahead and, and get started. Thanks, Leah. And just a note for those of, the, those of you who don't know me, first off, I'm an agronomist focusing exclusively on no-till, have been doing that for 24 years, and the equipment stuff came later. So uh, I'm, I'm very committed to helping everybody establish good, rigorous crops, make money, and uh, be sustainable. So some of you have heard my spiels before, but Uniform timing of emergence does matter for crops like wheat. It's not as big a deal as it is for a crop like corn or sunflowers or cotton, where they really truly need to all come up within a few hours of one another. But it still matters for wheat, and especially if you're trying to time fungicides uh, at bloom or heading, uh, you can't have part of the crop coming up a week or two later or a couple months later if you're not getting all the seeds to moisture. And what we're trying to do is instead of spending, using so much extra seed, whittle that down to a more reasonable seeds per acre and still be hitting our target populations a lot more often. Uh, instead of having these really inferior results, thin stands that kill your yields and cause a lot of other problems. You now those thin spots just grow up to weeds and you're going to spend money controlling them when you could have had a crop there making you money. Uh, I'm always amazed at how how good a weed suppression we get when we've got a nice thick uniform wheat stand that comes through the winter in good condition. So we're for those who might be reviewing this at another time, you know, saving seed is even more important for soybeans, for instance but we're gonna basically be focusing on fall planted crops because it's July and I'm in the Northern Hemisphere as probably most of you are as well. Um, so the attention to drill performance does pay off. Um, it's, it's worth doing. And depth does matter for winter wheat. Too deep reduces vigor. It really st stresses those plants a lot if they're coming from three or four inches instead of one or two. But too shallow can create problems for vulnerability to winter kill. It sets that crown right up there at the surface, might be more susceptible to uh, insects, diseases, herbicide injury. So there is a proper uh, planting depth and we wanna get most of the seeds to that depth. So here are the discrete steps and your John Deere 50, 60, 90, your Pro Series drill does these fairly well. They just need to be maintained, adjusted, and in some cases, there's some aftermarket upgrades that can help. So the first step, we're cutting the furrow to a consistent depth. We want sharp opener blades with a deep bevel. Replace those when half the original bevel is gone. Basically, everything out there has three-quarter inch bevel uh, when new. So when you're down to three-eighths, they are truly done. And in fact, you want to be able to get through the season before they get down to three eighths. Or you're not only going to be having more trouble with hair pinning, they're just not going to cut the soil very well. Their maximum dullness when the bevel is down to three eighths. So try to keep them well above that. There's some aftermarket blades out there with slightly larger diameters, 18 and 5 eighths, for instance, some are even 20. Stay away from those. You do not want anything larger than 18 inch. It, I can go through all the details of that, but long and short of it, the, the drill was designed to plant at two inches with the boot in the middle hole and new blades. When you start changing that, and then your boot's too far off the soil surface, and larger blades just hairpin worse. We've got a newsletter on that if you need uh, to 
review that or try to understand that better. Um, there's some brands out there that have dull edges even when new. Uh, Osmondson, SMA, they really, they're very inferior blades and stay away from those. And when you are installing new blades, make sure you get them on the correct direction. After a while, it starts looking like there's bevel on actually the opposite side that was the original bevel just from the wear. So people will mimic that and they'll get the, the darn things on backwards and they do not cut well uh, when, when they're on there that way. Remember, the bevel needs to be away from the goose wheel. The bevel is towards the furrow. Uh, everything cuts better this way. This is the opposite of double disc planters. So when cutting the furrow, we can't have too much play in the main pin. This is the pin that attaches the opener arm to the rock shaft, right behind the rock shaft. There's that big horizontal pin. And if you've got too much side play at the blade, it's time to take action about a quarter of an inch. I'll show you a video of that here in a moment. Um, but as that, th those blades are intended to run at seven degrees to the direction of travel. That's what's opening the soil, creating a furrow. And that blade is always trying to straighten out. So it's wearing those main pins and bushings on the same side, always trying to get straighter. And eventually they go long enough and there won't be much of a slit at all, not much wider than the blade itself. And of course, that's lousy um, for getting any seeds down in there at all. Um, that blade spo or that furrow at two inches deep, it's around three quarters of an inch wide at the top. Uh, if you start narrowing that up by a quarter of an inch, it, uh, you have a lot more seeds getting on top of the ground, a lot more wear on the boot, a lot more wear on the boot attachment point, more wear on the seed lock wheel. The seed lock wheel is going to have more trouble getting down to the seed because the furrow is too narrow. So we need to maintain that main pin and not have too much slop side to side. So if you do have quarter of an inch of slop or so the first time around you can rotate that pin 180 degrees the next time you got to replace the pin and bushings and there's a lot better stuff out there than OEM now although there's also some worse uh, product than OEM uh, there's some real junk pins and bushings out there where they're softer the chrome's not very thick uh, they're not good at all the ones that we carry from Eric's, those have Teflon bushings, and you're just wasting less down pressure because they run smoother uh, and everything works better. They last at least as long as OEMs, uh, and ours are half the price of OEM. So check the main pin slop, and uh, here's a little video of what that looks like when you're checking it. So this is pretty bad. It's got at least three eighths of an inch wobble there at, uh, at the blade's location. Um, here's that exact same opener at a slightly different vantage point. It looks even worse from here because uh, we're looking at the, at this part back here rather than the blade, but just be care just be aware of that when you're um, looking where you know where you're looking when you're shaking those. So here is that main pin. Here's that retaining bolt. If you're just turning this 180 degrees, you loosen this. Put a mark on here, whichever, so you can tell how far you've turned it. Put a pipe wrench on the end or a huge channel lock and just turn them. So also in cutting the furrow, we need to make sure the blade stays at a consistent depth. Now there's various things that can cause the seeds to not be at the bottom of the furrow. But right now we're talking about just is the furrow cut itself going to 
be consistent across the field and it's going to be effective going across the hard dry spots and the combine tracks sprayer tracks all that so we don't want the down pressure to lift the frame excessively or the depth will actually decrease the gauge wheel is rearward of the blade so just to get our heads wrapped around what's going on here is you've got the swing arm you're both lifting the opener and applying down pressure with the same twisting of the rock shaft so this opener is rotating this way to apply more pressure an equal and opposite reaction is with the frame going this way so it always lifts the ass end of the drill first you want a little bit of frame weight up in the front but you want the vast majority way back here this is where you have the maximum leverage it takes so much more up here versus right here and up in the front is not effective at all for holding the back rank the back end of the drill in the ground and as i said the gauge wheel where it's sitting on the soil surface is behind the where the blade is cutting maximum depth so as you rotate this under just imagine if it went all the way under the everything would be on the gauge wheel and the blade wouldn't even touch the ground so uh, as you're there's a little value in some rolling under but excessive rolling under creates issues so all you're doing there is you're compressing this big coil spring by rotating that rock shaft but if the frame is lifting you're not getting compression here so eventually we got to stop that frame from lifting and that's where we got to put extra frame weight and it's a lot easier to deal with this now when you've got time rather than wait until you get into the drilling season find out it's hard and dry or whatever and you need more frame weight at least have your brackets and weights ready to go so when you find out you need them you've got them there um, this is again is in the ideal location back here uh, here's a little different variation using suitcase weights. Uh, Exapt is actually going to start selling these, so you've got them ready to bolt on, but uh, not that hard to make your own either. A little bit of rolling under is okay because it makes the seed delivery channel more vertical. So here's your seed delivery channel through this boot. Notice it's about 45 degrees from horizontal. That is aiming the seed very far rearward, way back here where we've got sidewall crumbling in, beyond where the gauge wheel is holding the sidewall down. And it's just, uh, there's a lot more seed ricochet out of the furrow when it's that far back. It's difficult to control. Whereas a seed tube that was much more vertical, you'd be dropping up here and it's much more controlled. So this is really a poor design Notice, note that planters drop far more vertically. This was uh, an attempt to get around some things and uh, overall just isn't that great. So here you can see what's going on. Just by not running enough down pressure, uh, you can have your boot back here. So this trajectory here that's already too flat, it gets even worse back here. And you're really shooting a lot of seeds out of the furrow or they're so they're dropping in so far rearward that a lot of sidewall has collapsed ahead of them but if we can roll that opener under a little bit now our seed channel is more vertical and we can do a lot better placing it we see the same thing with planters that's why i'm always preaching about planters need to be nose up the row unit needs to be nose up uh, a few degrees we can do so much better getting the seeds where they need to be a little nose up versus a little nose down. Another thing about rolling that opener under is that down pressure spring is far more effective uh, when it's more vertical versus horizontal. It translates more of the spring pressure into downward force. And so you can visualize that pretty good here. Um, at a horizontal position you may have if you compress that spring two inches in a horizontal position it's not doing any pressing down 
and it rotated fully under so that that spring was vertical, then all of the pressure of that spring would be on the opener. We run these, they typically run at about 45, so you're getting half of the spring pressure transferred. But rolling that under a few degrees more, as opposed to letting it skate out, that makes a lot of difference in keeping the opener in the ground and getting the seeds where they need to be. The 50 series actually operate at a little more vertical orientation than 6090, so they did a better job at developing down pressure, but they had less transport clearance. Oh, just a little bit of trivia there for you. The springs do cause problems, uh, partly because they just have no downstroke, and that's you know partly because of the the design of the whole unit. So I mentioned we're trying to compress that spring, and, and we try to compress it at least two inches, and sometimes as much as three, by torquing that rock shaft and weighting the frame. But if you're in a light, a little bit of a depression here, say you've got an old disc ridge here, or you've got a, a wheel track, you let that spring relax so it's only an inch or an inch and a half compression, you've lost half your pressure right there. And if it's in a wheel track, just when you need maximum pressure, now you've got half or maybe even zero if that spring relaxes all the way. So uh, not to turn this into a sales pitch, but if you just can't get those springs to work right, and I have yet to see anybody who can, we do have a way to overcome that. So you now get full pressure all the way to the end of the stroke. It eliminates a lot of hairpinning. And Uniforce also makes better use of the frame weight that you do have, or uh, it, and or you can drive faster, depending on your choice. Take some weight off with Uniforce or keep the same weight and drive faster and still do a better job. If you're still hairpinning, not being able to solve that problem, there's row cleaners out there. This is an extra heavy duty one that we import from Australia. Uh, and here's just an idea. You know, I see a lot of wheat emerge like this. We just can't get enough of that straw out, out away from the furrow. So here's the difference, row cleaners versus none. Here, just this one row had row cleaner. You can see all this lousy stand on either side, and that row is perfect. So I think there's uh, something to be gained from those. So we need to place seeds consistently in the bottom of the furrow. That's our next step. The seed boot is an important ingredient in that. You can't have the seed boots worn out. Now this one is way, way, way worn out, uh, long shot. You, even if this were just starting to arch up in here, uh, it would be causing problems right down in here. You can't have any uh, any arc here that needs to be perfectly flat across the bottom at the end of the season, even uh, uh, um, at the, it needs to be all good all the way through the season because the minute that starts to arc up a little bit there, you get more duff and dust falling into the furrow. So you want to check to see if it's real. If the metal is getting real thin here. Uh, it's time to replace. And always look at the ones in the tractor track. Those wear the fastest. Here's the old 60 series boot. They had a lot of problems because this channel would shoot the seed uh, over onto the blade and the blade would fling it out of the furrow. They had other problems. It was wider, it moved forward, it drug harder in the soil, a lot of issues. But really, the seed placement was just pretty bad on these. So if you still have 60 series boots, upgrade them to 90. Um, the boot attachment point up here. Remember, this trajectory is already too flat uh, through here. And if this, this boot, when you're running in the soil, the stubble and skimming the top of the, the soil, uh, the boot will ride, want to be riding up. It'll want to float up. And its boot attachment point controls that. Well, the more it rides up, the flatter this angle gets, and you have a big gap down here, and seats are going every which direction. 
You need to keep that boot down. So uh, I'll show you a video here of um, the boot attachment. This is really bad. Look how much movement we're getting back here. It's probably three quarters of an inch, maybe even more than that. Uh, that's terrible. Uh, I don't want probably more than three sixteenths of an inch up down movement there. Certainly not more than a quarter of an inch. Um, just a little bit makes it so much worse because it's flattening that trajectory and creating a gap there. Uh, at the at below the boot so there's a number of ways of repairing this uh, there's a drill bit guide that you can get that runs through here and makes these holes oversized you put a sleeve in there uh, they work pretty good the downside is if you don't use enough anti-seize going through here your bolts will rest solid to this and they're a real bitch to get out um, craft and green drill fix that's what they use. Pro Stitch uses a jacker bolt to, um, they bolt a piece on here that aligns to the top of this and they're cranking this jacker bolt down, pushing on the top of the boot to hold it uh, straight with, to align it to these ears. Um, if you use those, make sure you don't tighten them up all the way. You can't, you do not want to get all the movement out of that boot. It just holds it too rigid and then they plug in heavy straw and you'll really be cussing them. Uh, there is a reason to have a little bit of movement in that boot hole, not only to let the straw clear out, but also to ensure that the boot aligns to the blade correctly uh, and stays flush up against it. Probably the best solution out there is uh, Eric's from Australia or Needham. They bolt the, uh, the bolt clamps tight in that hole uh, outside the ear. It's an oversized bolt. It's got a step on it. So it's clamping tight and then the boot swivels on that bolt instead of the bolt turning inside uh, the ears, the hole in the ears. So it's just clamping. It's like you've uh, welded studs on there for the boot to turn on, except it's just a bolt that goes through their shoulder bolt um, that the boot swivels on. Um, it's great if you're buying new boots that already have the bigger hole to accommodate that bolt. If you're trying to use your existing bolts, then it's not so much fun, especially if you've got extended wear. Those, those high chrome boots are, uh, well, they're quite a quite a challenge to drill out. Uh, even if you get the super premium bits to drill through them, you'll destroy a number of bits getting through them. And um, right now you can't even buy these Needham uh, boots because there's John Deere is being, uh, causing issues and claiming that they're infringing on patents and whatnot, which I don't see how those patents have long since expired, but whatever. So right now it's basically you gotta buy John Deere boots as of today, unless you can find somebody who still has them. Um, so even on a brand new 90 series opener, I would immediately replace those uh, 3 8 bolts with the next size up in metric to take some of that slop out. You need a little bit, but not too much. Now the new Pro Series, that's different. Um, and if you have a Pro Series, you're probably not watching this because you don't have anything worn out. Um, this boot, again, would, there's a flap back here trying to control the seat bounce as it's coming, you know, ricocheting out. Uh, this flap needs to stay down in here. And just remember, if as this boot rotates up, now not only is the bottom of the boot above the soil line, you've got a big gap, but now this flap is suspended up in the air and it's not doing anything at all. So if we can be a little over rotated, we can make that seat bounce flap work better. Here's the OEM flap. This is an important piece. Yeah, sure, it's just a little strip of plastic, but these need to be 
pretty close to full length and they can't be bent up or broken. They they're, they need to close this gap. They need to, their bank board to knock the seed down in the furrow. And even when everything's right, you've still got this triangular gap here that seeds want to bounce out. But at least, you know, if this is broken off, you've got seeds going everywhere. Or if it's curled up, I see some of that sometimes. There's another photo of it. You know, the boot's down here, flush with the soil surface. Everything's good. So we've got enough down pressure, but there's a gap here. And other aftermarket places will sell you a thicker, heavier, longer flap, but it's still very rigid. You can see that we still have some tendency for a triangular gap here. And the more you over rotate, mash that down in there, because it's pretty rigid, it'll ride on the sidewalls. So you end up with a gap. So to close the gap, I came up with this, like, well, why make it out of a piece of flexible, semi-rigid plastic? Yeah, sure, it's super cheap to make them that way, but it's not a very good design. By angling the flap 20 degrees forward, we're making sure that we close that gap. We never, never create that triangular gap. We're knocking seats down. We're a lot more effective bank board. We're keeping them knocked down farther forward in relation to the blade rather than letting them hit back farther back where the sidewalls caving in. These are flexible uh, so that when they're running along the bottom, just this lower end will flex, it'll curve a little bit, but this bottom or this upper part being thicker, uh, it always stays uh, down in there to close that up. And here you can see them in action. They're so far down, so far forward that you can hardly even see them. Now this boot is actually, this opener didn't have enough pressure on it. We've got a pretty sizable gap between the boot and the soil line, which I told you would occur if you don't have enough down pressure. But even so, the boot, the, the ninja flap is doing a pretty good job of uh, getting seeds down where they need to be. It's not letting them, you know, the trajectory is flat through here, but the flap is knocking them down. It's being the bank board. So pay attention to those flaps. Air velocity, through an air drill, the seeds are moving fast. You've got all this air that's needing to dump and it's coming out the bottom of the boot. So slowing the seed down, venting some of that air beforehand is a good thing for seed placement. Now the first, you know, the other things I told you about having enough down pressure, using a good seed bounce flap, those are the first orders of business. Get those taken care of. If you still don't think you're getting enough seeds to the bottom of the furrow, start uh, looking at diffusers. Uh, these are in the secondaries. This is one that Dutch Industries came up with and later uh, Needham made a copy of it. He sells them. There's uh, some other secondaries on the market. Uh, we'll, we're looking at uh, importing one from Australia that looks kind of intriguing. Um, but the problem with all those secondaries is, well, there is a lot of them. You know, there's 48 of them maybe on your air drill or a really big air drill, there might be 96. So I haven't seen one yet that doesn't want to accumulate uh, seed treatments, fertilizer dust. Uh, eventually, you need to do some sort of cleaning and maintenance on these. And of course, if there's 48 or 96, you're going to be a long time doing that. So to get you most of the way there with a lot less hassle, we've got diffusers uh, that uh, we're the exclusive marketer reviews that come from Australia called the Seed View. They go right into the distribution tower, uh, the head of your, your drill. So they're venting the air there. The idea being that once you push the seed and fertilizer up this vertical pipe, now it should be mostly gravity feed from there on down to the openers, especially if you've got these secondary lines where they adjusted for the proper length. So you can dump half, two thirds of the air here and do yourself a lot of good uh, if these secondaries are vertical enough. Now that's a big problem on the five section drills. On the 50 and 60 footers, 
because of the way they fold tight, these towers are not very high and you've got a lot of secondaries that are running horizontal. So you're just wasting your time trying to put a seed view on those, in my opinion. Uh, those you need the secondaries. But for the three section drills, this is a nice way to vent a lot of air, cure a lot of problems, adjust your secondaries so they don't have a lot of extra swags in them. Try to get them vertical. Move your towers upward. Uh, there's, there's adjustments for that. Move the tower upward. There's a lot of clearance on those three section drills to move them farther up. So this is a quick, convenient way. You know, if you get anything coming up in here, you've only got, say, six of these as opposed to 48 or more. Um, so it's, it's easy. And if, if you don't want to clean them right now, or you're in a hurry or you've got, you're planting calf and it's getting through these tiny little holes, you can have all these off of here and the original caps back on in two minutes. Try doing that with secondary diffusers. So the only thing guiding the seed into position is the furrow sidewall. As we see from this, this boot, in relation to the blade here, here's your depth. That's where your your blade is cut the deepest. It's now just holding sidewall out. So if it's very loose and dry, by the time the blade gets up here, some dust will start wanting to come back into the furrow. And our trajectory is way back here. It's gonna arrive right here, unless we've got wear up here, or we don't have enough down pressure on the opener, now the trajectory is way back here somewhere, and there's a lot more stuff falling into the furrow. So for this to work properly on a single disc opener, the only thing guiding the seed into location is the integrity of this sidewall in this area right here. And we help prevent that sidewall from collapsing prematurely by applying pressure with that gauge tire. And that's why we need enough pressure to keep that gauge tire consistently on the soil surface and holding everything together. Um, here's what happens if you don't have enough pressure. Uh, it's hovering. It, the soil is following that blade. So again, the more vertical we can, we can have that trajectory, rolling the opener under a little bit, maintaining our seat boot so it doesn't have slop. We, we will do a better job. But in holding the sidewall together, we want that gauge wheel lightly touching the blade at the rear. I do not care what it is doing up at the front. If it touches the front first and you've got a gap at the rear, it means the arm is bent, you need to replace the arm. But if there's just a, a slight, uh, things are not aligning slightly, what I care about is it lightly touching at the rear, or gap at the front, I don't care about. Do not use RID gauge tires, anything indented. I want them uh, to be as large a circumference up next to the blade as anywhere on that gauge tire. Uh, gauge tire, gauge wheel width, we really prefer three inch instead of the old wide four and a half inch. It keeps more stubble standing, but it also holds the sidewall together better because instead of spreading that pressure out more we've, uh, and having gauge wheels rolling across more root balls and stalks and whatnot, we've now got that pressure concentrated up closer to the blade. Yeah, it probably is causing more sidewall compaction, but at least it's only on one side of the furrow, unlike a double disc opener, like a planter that compacts both sides. And we are hopefully going to tear up that side wall with a good spoke closing wheel when we're done. So here's what I'm talking about. I, I didn't change this. I was just out looking at a drill. I was like, oh my goodness. Look at this huge gap. That's got to be like three eighths of an inch or more. So there's a lot of dust falling in ahead of the seed and chunks of side wall when it's this bad. You're not controlling that side wall at all. Even a, even half as much is way too much. Furthermore, if it's muddy, you're you're going to have a lot of mud build up on this blade with this huge gap there. You do need to shim those. Um, while we're talking about gauging depth, holding depth, gauge wheels, this depth shaft here, if you're having trouble keeping them free, the 
the early uh, 60 series and some of the 90 series, they didn't have this flat spot. It was a round shaft, so they didn't take grease very well. So if you're rebuilding them, uh, either put a new shaft in or take the old shaft and grind a flat spot in there so the grease can flow along. And uh, the seals in here help a lot. And uh, we know of one farmer who's at least three years now, probably going on four years, we, when he gets this all cleaned up in here with new seals, he uses fluid film instead of grease, and it works a lot better. Uh, you, you still shoot fluid film through there using a grease gun every so often during the season, but it just uh, it, it keeps things moving a lot nicer, and it doesn't pack tight with dirt like grease does. So moving along here, getting close to the end now on the home stretch, firming the seed by applying pressure right down here. That's where these drills do a good job. Now, if the whole drill is sliding down slope, you're, you're, uh, or you're making a corner, things don't align very well. That's where a flexible firming wheel, seed lock wheel will help you. Uh, but also I want to point out, here's the shape of your furrow. If that main pin is wearing too much and you lose a third of this width, uh, you've now got this much narrower and tighter down here. And those those Fermi wheels that are too rigid, running on rigid rims, they, they want to ride up on the sidewall anyway. And you narrow that up and now they're really running on the sidewall. So the history of these drills, this was the very first earliest 750s, like the first thousand or so built. These are actually the V closing wheels off of a planter, way too wide too soon. They did a lousy job. Um, so pretty quick, Deer figured out, okay, they they still had this rubber tire an inch wide, but at least the, the metal part of the rim wasn't widening the whole way. It actually came a little bit narrower. And they stuck with that uh, all through uh the early 90s series until they came out i think it was 05 came out with the ones that uh uh well the the rubber tire is a lot narrower now it's kind of a v v-shaped triangle shaped uh rubber tire and those work a lot better except that the tires tear out of the rim a lot but they do fit down in there vastly better than the old one inch wide ones. If you have the old one inch, you benefit a lot from moving on to something better. Uh, the Pro Series now uses a, uh, well, it's basically a, a knockoff of the Needham V8. They're so close at the, the old V8, the rubber tire version. Um, so once again, you know, even though deer keeps thinking they're improving, the aftermarket is still way ahead of them. So the, the tendency on all those seed lock wheels, each iteration deer comes out with is a little bit narrower. They're still not narrow enough. We've determined that our Duralock is optimum at 0.45 inches. It really, even when that main pin is up to spec, you need something pretty narrow down at the, the lower end. Um, yeah, in theory, you you could get these too narrow to where they uh, weren't firming all the seeds, but that certainly isn't the case yet at 0.45 inches. They're gathering all the seeds and getting them stuffed down in there and firmed really good. Flexible, better than rigid. Uh, urethane is better than a rubber tire. A rubber tire indents. The seed will actually indent the rubber if the soil is pretty firm. Uh, whereas urethane is hard enough that it makes sure that the seed goes down in the furrow. So you lose some of your firming action with the rubber tire. You've got to run a lot more pressure on a rubber tire than you do a urethane wheel. Plus, urethane will last, I don't know, at least three times longer than rubber, maybe five times. Uh, and they shed mud better. You know, the argument, Deer's argument's always been a rubber, rubber sheds mud. Well, no, that's not true. We've done the testing. Uh, a good urethane compound that's slick will shed mud the best of anything. Run these in the maximum pressure setting. That's behind the last peg, not between the pegs on the 60 and 90. 
And that's especially true for soybeans and peas that really got to absorb a lot of water, really got to mash them in the bottom quite well. Here's our Duralac. Uh, Needham now has a urethane wheel. It's a little bit wider than ours, and I'm not as excited about the shape of his rim or the longevity of his bearings as compared to ours. Uh, the longevity is a very impressive uh, double row bearing, but they, if it's that pure seed extreme, it actually, they put so many seals in there, the contact pressure of those seals has to be so minuscule to keep the wheel turning that now they don't seal up and keep the dirt out. So the engineers were just much too clever for themselves. They should have stuck with the old triple lip seal instead of trying to do six seals per side. Sliding firmers, poor choice, stay away from them. Uh, Keaton's especially are terrible because it's a swing arm design, it's not a parallel length, so that angle's changing all the time. If you want to do a sliding firmer, there's the fin that bolts on instead of that seed lock wheel. But everybody I know who's had those eventually went back to the firming wheels. These wear out too quickly, and the firming is never quite as good as you get with a firming wheel. Side to side play in the pivot for the seed lock arm doesn't matter. In fact, you know, it, if anything, it probably helps you because it's letting that seed lock wheel move side to side and stay in the furrow better. Uh, it's just that much less that the firming wheel itself has to flex. So I don't care about slide, side play. Let's make sure that they move up and down freely and the, string, the spring hasn't been stretched or broken. Uh, we have, if you're tired of greasing these and cleaning out the, the dirt that gets packed in that pivot point, uh, we have a, uh, a kit to replace those that uh, it's got a good enough seal in there that you don't have to grease them. You, you grease them when you install them and you're done. Never grease them again. So people are pretty thrilled with that. They will last at least as long as OEM and they'll move a lot more smoothly during that old time. Closing the furrow. If you got the stock wheel back here, these hop a lot, spoked wheels hop less. Also, this, uh, this wheel is so heavy that it puts a lot of wear on this attachment point. And eventually these wheels, that attachment point will wear so much that your closing wheel isn't anywhere near where it should be to do a good job closing the furrow. So looking at the, the closing arm, uh, the wiggle there, let me show you uh, a couple of these. Little videos here. This one's pretty bad. We're probably getting at least three eighths, almost a half inch of movement out here. That's not going to keep that wheel where it needs to be to do the best job of closing. Uh, here's one that's not terrible, but getting some wear. Here we're probably moving uh, less than a quarter of an inch, between an eighth and a quarter. I'll show that to you again. This one's sort of in between. If you're wanting to do a really good job, I'd probably do something with that, or a lot of people would ignore that and think it's it's probably okay for a while yet. Um, it's not terrible. Oop. So to repair that slop, there's bushings and a sleeve that go in there. Also, you need to replace the washer and nut uh, that's in there. It's kind of a special one. The John Deere ones are just grade five. Ours are grade eight. I'll show you what's going on here. So here's the bushing, the inner bushing, the sleeve, and the outer bushings that need to be replaced to take up the slop. This is an old 50 series drawing where they had two washers, just an ordinary lock nut here. On the 90 series, uh, this washer has been combined with this nut. It's now a flange 
lock nut, but it's smooth flange. It's not serrated. So it's a special one that's hard to find. And the reason it can't be serrated is there needs to be, there's turning movement between this washer and this, the flange of this lock nut because this arm's going up and down. This basically, this all clamps tight here. This against this against this against the arm clamps tight to where this, this piece becomes integral with the arm. So this knot and this, this flange lock knot or washer, if it's 50 series, it's turning with this arm up and down, up and down. This washer uh, tends to be stationary. It's got to turn here or against this housing. And usually it doesn't want to turn here. It turns here instead. So gradually it eats into this washer, which creates even more lateral movement of your closing arm and the spring that holds that closing arm in whatever setting you want, the more lateral movement there is here, the more likely that spring is to pop out of the setting that you wanted it to be in. So as you get too much wear here, there's basically anytime you're in here doing something with these bushings, you probably take a close look at these. You probably want to replace that washer and that lock nut. Here's a 90 series. They get worn a lot worse than this, folks. This is not extreme by any means, but you can see it, all that up and down movement wears into that grade five washer pretty quickly um, and causes issues. Why spoke closing wheels? It's a good choice agronomically. Uh, it also doesn't, uh, if they're not so heavy, it doesn't wear that pivot point so much. But you'll just have a lot more uh, consistent emergence and faster emergence if you use a spoke closing wheel. We want to break up that sidewall um, so the roots grow through it, especially if there's a crown uh, that needs to develop like there is for wheat. We want uh, some soil over the crown to insulate it. Here's just a summary of different spoke closing wheel types. Here's what the Thompson wheel does. Uh, in whatever testing we do, we do seeding school every year, at least on planters, nothing has ever surpassed the Thompson wheel, at least not consistently. Okay, we spent all this time getting that drill up to spec. So it does a good job. Well, don't forget seed quality. There's some things on our website. Test the seed, even for wheat seed. Do a cold germ uh, and accelerated aging and use the more stringent labs. The, uh, the best is SGS Brookings or Sodak labs. The, the, those are really the, the most stringent. Uh, your university labs are far less discerning on cold tests. So especially if your wheat got rained on when it was ripe uh, before it got harvested, or if there's any chance whatsoever that it got uh, warm or condensation moved around in the bin, just sample that seed. Make sure it's okay. It's too expensive of a process to gamble on that. It's such a cheap, simple thing to do is to sample your seed a month before, send it into the lab, make sure you've got good stuff. Uh, this is not really drill maintenance, but drip box drills, open that gate like you would for soybeans, even if you're seeding wheat. Air drills, use a meter roll that turns faster, so it's a smaller roll, You'll, it won't be so clumpy. Use better riser pipes, um, like our small air. It's a, get, it does a better job of randomizing, scattering that seed going up into the the head so you're not overloading one side of the head. We've got a lot more info on our DVDs with things like adjusting the drill in the field, uh, more maintenance tips, fertilizer options, some agronomy advice, things like that. Uh, we've got a lot more detailed info in our newsletters showing you some things that I can't all cover today. We've got YouTube videos that show you how to install some of these things and other uh, features and maintenance points to look at. So I guess I chewed up a lot of time there. Uh, we'll take any questions now. Okay, 
the first question we got was if anyone makes an aftermarket boot with a better design no nobody makes a boot with a better design we've been working on one for years but it's so complicated that i don't think anybody wants to buy it so we've never marketed it thoughts on a urethane gauge wheel tire uh urethane gauge wheel tires are great in that they last forever the downside is that they probably cause more soil compaction so um, we know from any other implement tire is that if it can give a little bit as it meets the soil it spreads out over a, a bigger working area and that cushions the damage to the soil so I find it hard to believe that there wouldn't be more compaction with a urethane tire than with uh, uh, one of these semi-pneumatic rubber tires that have the hollow core. And on that point, make sure you get the ones that, ha that have some softness to them, especially on the narrow ones. Some of those are, are about hard as a rock. You can't indent them at all. Uh, the ones I like the most are the Mudsmith which is it's a rubber tire, but it's 20% thicker, which means it lasts almost twice as long, and yet it's still soft and spongy when it meets the soil. If you've got really great soils up north, Canada, North Dakota somewhere, probably urethane tires are okay. If you're farther south and soils that have terrible infiltration problems anyway, and low organic matter and just behave badly, I'd be leery about the urethane gauge tires. Okay, how often do you recommend to grease the drill openers? Which part? The, I'm not sure. It says how often um, should drill openers be greased? Um, if if you're doing like the fluid film through the depth shaft it needs to be done like once per season once in the spring once in the fall if if you use it both times uh the um if, if, on the uh firming and closing if you got a 90 series of grease certs on the firming and closing gre grease them off and up so they don't seize up uh, if you've got a a bushing kit installed there that has seals well you only have to do that once and done speaking of greasing the firming and closing um it, when someone does go to replace those and say they are both shot which one would you say is more important to keep up to par Well, as far as side play, I only care about the closing arm. Side play on the firming arm doesn't bother me at all. Now, they do still need to move up and down freely so that your firming arm isn't getting stuck up in the air or is taking so much of the spring pressure to overcome that resistance that it's not doing a good job firming the seed. Okay. How much pressure should you run on down pressure in firm no-till like wheat into soybean stubble? Um, okay, firm no-till wheat into soybean stubble. If it's been no-till, low disturbance no-till for a number of years, will be way up into the red on the gauge need at least two inches of compression of that big coil spring and probably three so everybody worries about running in the red on that on those gauges because there's a warning in the the operator's manual about bearings failing well i know people that have ran up in the red for tens of thousands of acres we can't tell that the the bearings have went out any sooner than somebody who didn't do that and even if it did i'm not sure we care because Getting the crop stand is more important than slightly accelerated wear on those uh, main opener bearings. 
and actually run enough pressure, it cuts down on wear on a lot of other things because it's not jumping around like a pogo stick all the time. So in terms of numbers, I'm not sure all those gauges are the same anyway, but running 1500 PSI pressure on uh, with the OEM springs, that's pretty common. Uh, if you got enough frame weight, there's people that'll go up to, you know, 1800. 1900, 2000. Okay, next question. If I can't afford Uniforce, but I'm looking for a little better spring pressure on a box drill, are the spring spacers and the tire tracks a decent cheap alternative? I know it doesn't fix problems in uneven ground, but is it worth it for just the tire tracks? It might help a bit for the tire tracks that are freshly created by the tractor and any tow between cart. The problem is there's tracks out there that are going to be a whole lot harder than the ones that you just created. In other words, they're the um, your combine tracks and sprayer tracks. The fresh tracks aren't nearly so much of the problem. So you got to penetrate all those old combine tracks and those spacers are not going to help you much in that regard unless you're controlled traffic and in that case they probably would okay next question do you have any suggestions for monitoring the travel wheels and bearings on the drill frame no i don't Okay, are you better off not to grease at all to keep things from binding up in real dusty conditions? Uh, that doesn't seem to work either. We've had so people, it is better to grease. Yeah, it's better to grease. Unless you take all the grease out, then maybe it'd be okay, but there's always going to once there's grease in there the grease is going to find its way to into those little crevices and then it combines with the existing grease to form concrete eventually real gummy hard stuff so about the only way i know of to avoid greasing is to clean it all the guy who's doing the fluid film on the the depth shaft is also trying to use it on the firming and closing, and that might be better. Uh, it kind of sounded like maybe it was. Uh, but if you're really sick of greasing those those other two pivot points on the firming and closing, really the best way to do that is to install a, a kit with a seal, either our Arex kit or a Needham kit. Deer has deer started putting seals in them in 09, but it didn't solve the problem. Their seals aren't near as good as ours. Okay, next question. My factory weight brackets are on the front of the drill. How can I tell how much more weight to put on the rear of the drill? And how do I put those on? Well, right now it's sort of a do-it-yourself program to put weights above that transport wheel. We should have some brackets to sell for the free section drills uh, oh, within a few weeks if you if you like our solution. Um, how much you need? Well, it's enough to keep that wheel from lifting up in the air. You probably take some of that that you've got off of the front and move it to the rear. It doesn't take much up in the front, maybe three suitcase weights where it might take a dozen or more above each transport wheel. And and that's just a good start. Uh, going into really hard conditions, I've had as much as 80 suitcase weights on a 36 foot drill and we needed all of it. Okay, Matt, I do not believe you showed how to measure a blade with it still installed, did you? No, I didn't, but that's on YouTube. Can you YouTube explain that? And, okay. Mm -hmm. I think there's a newsletter on it as well. Okay. For those listening in, could you just quickly explain 
how to easily measure that. Well, um, I don't remember what the dimension is, but just you can measure the blade from the hub out to the edge of the blade rather than removing a blade. Okay, Matt, moving on to the next question. Um, how is Exaptive's firming wheel better than Needham's firming wheel? Our firming wheel is better than Needham's because it's a bit narrower and because our hub doesn't gather mud and vines as much as his. And also, we've got a more durable bearing, which is surprising because his is a double row bearing, but if the pure seed extreme bearing, uh, they tried to get fancy and it just, those fail much too easily. Um, so those are the differences. Is there a way to get a better stand with an 1890 in tilled ground? Or do you have any pointers? An 1890 just is the wrong tool to be using in a tilled situation. You really want a double disc opener to keep all that loose soil out of the way while you're trying to get seeds down to a certain depth. And if you have to use it, go less than four miles an hour, take most of the pressure off, and it'll sort of work, but it won't be pretty. It won't be ideal. It's, it'll be a long way from ideal. Do you have a removal tool or know of a removal tool for a seed depth adjustment shaft? Uh, no, I don't. Most people take the whole thing off and put it in a big press, sometimes with heat. If I was working on a budget, what are the three most important wear points to keep up to par? Oh, that's a tough one. Uh, blade, boot, including attachment hole, and main pin. So far, that's all the questions we've received. Um, anyone else, if you have questions, I would say now would be the time to type them in. Matt, is it possible for a boot to be too rigid? Oh, yes. Yes. Um, that boot needs a little bit of uh, up-down wiggle in order to be able to clear straw out. So don't eliminate all the the play with that. Do you have any pointers on the riser towers and manifolds? Um, what specifically in John Deere older designs, the pros and cons of those? Yeah, uh, the older John Deere uh, distribution heads, those old flat top heads, they're steel. Those are not real great. Uh, they've got that long J bolt that goes down into the riser pipe. And studies have shown that just by virtue of that bolt being there, you have 2% seed breakage on peas and soybeans. Not to mention it gathers up fertilizer gunk and then that piece breaks off and falls down in your boot, plugs the boot. There's a lot of seed damage striking that, that flat plate. So those old heads, it, you know, it's probably time to think about upgrading those, get rid of those old heads. Uh, you can put on a flexicoil head, uh, you can put on our small air head, or you can put on the new John Deere rubbery heads. That, uh, the, the new Deere heads are pretty nice. Uh, I like them. Uh, the riser pipe itself, the, Deer design isn't all that great because it's got a simple mandrel band and it, the seed tends to ricochet back and forth going up that, the rest of the riser. Um, small air, 
what we sell as an, an enlarged elbow there. So it creates a pressure drop and turbulence so that you get get some scattering of the seed going up the, that pipe and it doesn't overload one side of the distribution head. You get a lot more uh, even flow, uh, more randomized going out the secondaries rather than too much going out some secondaries and not enough on the others. So there's room for improvement, certainly. And you can mix and match those. You can put on our small air riser pipe and a John Deere head. I think there's a, a steel ring you got to knock off to make that work. Um, the small air, of course, works with their own small air heads pretty easily. Okay, Matt, we're starting to get a few, quite a few more questions. Um, what's the differences between your seed bounce flap and Needham's? Ours has a 20 degree forward band and it's flexible and it's not overly long so that it's just tickling the bottom of the furrow. The bottom part of it is flexible, more flexible than higher up. So it trails along there and it keeps the seeds down there where they need to be. They have a lot more seeds getting to where they need to be with our flap versus the vanilla flap. Okay, the next question. Uh, we use spins to apply seed row fertilizer. If we were to switch to firming wheels, how would you suggest we apply seed row fertilizer? The stainless tube device that goes over the wheel creates too big of a mess with the closing well. That is the big problem on box drills, is how to get any pop-up fertilizer down there. Uh, if you're not willing to use dry, and a lot of people don't want to use dry on a box drill for understandable reasons. The, the liquid really needs to go behind the seed lock wheel. If you squirt it in ahead of the seed lock wheel, it causes buildup on the seed lock wheel, and that's no good. So. It needs to go behind, and yes, it creates a mess. I know of no other, no no way around it. It's just a necessary evil. But you do need pop-up fertilizer for no-till wheat. Do you have any tips for removing bushings with the Eric removal tool, pre-soaking or lubricating? in particular in front of the 1590s where it is hard to get in there? I'm sure lube is going to help, but other than that, I don't have any tips. Make sure you use a big air wrench. It'll drive out a lot. Have you found anything that improves spacing, especially in soybeans? Uh, Spacing can be improved uh, on a box drill by putting those gates in a more open position on a, uh, and on an air drill by using a, a smaller meter roll, making it turn faster. Your spacing can be improved with your riser pipe and distribution head choice. And uh, some of these secondaries that cause the seeds to spiral around through a chamber, those can further improve spacing. Majority of drills that we do drive up on, the secondary hoses are, do have too much slack in them, I will say. So if we can get those as vertical as possible, it does improve. Yeah, it'll let you run lower air pressure for sure. Now the more fan speed you're running, to keep those secondaries from, from clogging, uh, the worse off you are for seed bounce. And some people run them so high that they're in a continuous stall, which creates a lot of uh, pulsing and surging and nothing works right then. So yeah, get, the, get all the swags out of your secondary. First raise that, those towers up as much as possible and then shorten up the secondaries that have swags in them or, tie them up if you need to in their midpoint. Do whatever you have to to, to get them to not have uh, 
horizontal spots in them. Um, for how much how much labor time do you allow for a complete rebuild per row? Kind of hard to say. Yeah, I don't know. It depends on how rested up it is, everything is. Approximately how many acres uh, drill covers that you should start looking at wear point? The rough number. Well, in Kansas, 2,000 acres on a 30-foot drill, and a lot of stuff is going to be worn out. 2,000 acres in North Dakota, and it's still brand new. Um, one question I thought of that some that we do often get is how do you measure when the leaf springs are shot? Oh, how do that's you one thing that? I didn't cover. Yeah, uh, when you're inspecting your drill, lift the the firming wheel up in one hand and then pull the boot away from the blade and how how much snap it has, how uh, loudly it clangs back against the blade determines uh, that's a sign of how much spring pressure you've got. So it should smack back against that blade and make a pretty loud sound if it's uh if it's not doing that it needs to be replaced um, is there a way to use a fish scale or, or some kind of weight to get a, a number a specific uh, i'm sure there is but i've never done that i just go by how it looks Basically, anytime I put on new boots, I put on new leaf springs. <laughs>